Chapters 30 and 31 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 Sex and Young America discusses present day sex arrangements as they affect the future generation. Our first task is to consider how people actually behave in the matter of sex, as distinguished from the way they pretend to behave. The first and most necessary step in the cure of any disease is a correct diagnosis, and in this case we have not merely to make the diagnosis, but to prove it, because the most conspicuous fact about our present sex arrangements is a mass of organized concealment. Not merely do teachers and preachers, for the most part, suppress all mention of these subjects, but the defenders of our present economic disorder are accustomed to acclaim the private property regime as the only basis of family life. So long as people hold such an idea, there is no use trying to teach them anything on the subject. There is no use talking to them about monogamous love because all they understand is hypocrisy. In this chapter, therefore, we shall proceed to hold up the mirror in front of capitalist morality. I pause and consider. Where shall I begin? At the top of society or at the bottom? With the city or the country? With the old or the young? I think you care most of all about your boys and girls, so I am going to tell you what is happening to the youth of America in these days of triumphant reaction. I have a son, about whom naturally I think a great deal. Just now he is a student at one of our state universities, and he wrote me the other day, I went to a dance, and believe me, father, if you knew what these modern dances mean, you would write something about them. I know what they mean. They have come to us straight from the brothels of the Argentine, among the vilest haunts of vice in the world. Others have come from the jungle, where they were natural. The poor creature of the jungle has his sex desire and nothing else. He is not troubled with brains. He does not have a complicated social organism to build up and protect. Consequently, he does not need what are called morals. But we civilized people need morals, and we are losing them. And our society is disintegrating, going back to the howling and fighting and cannibalism of the jungle. Professor William James, America's greatest psychologist, tells us that going through the motions appropriate to an emotion automatically causes that emotion to be felt. If you watch an actor preparing to rush on the stage in an emotional scene, you will see him walking about, clenching his fists, stamping his feet, making ferocious faces, working himself up. And now, what do you think is going on in the minds of young men and women, while with their bodies, they are going through procedures which are nothing and can be nothing but imitations of sexual contact. The parents, it appears, are ignorant and unsophisticated and have left it for their children to find out what these dances mean. In Rhode Island, one of our old estates is Brown College, chosen by New England's aristocracy for the education of its sons. And these boys go to social affairs in the best homes in Providence, and they call them petting parties. And here's what they write in their college paper. The modern social bud drinks not too much, often, but enough. She smokes unguardedly, swears considerably, and tells dirty stories. All in all, she is a most frivolous, passionate, sensation-seeking little thing. This statement, published in a college paper, causes a scandal, and a newspaper reporter goes to interview the college boy who edits the paper, and this boy talks. He tells how he met a lovely girl at a dance, and his heart was thrilled with the rapture of young love. 
Frankly, between you and me, I was pretty smitten with this particular little lady. Felt about her, don't you know, like a real guy feels about a girl he could imagine himself married to. Thought she was too nice to touch, almost. You know the grave sort of love affair a man always has once in a lifetime. Well, we talked a bit, and I guess I didn't say much. For a while, I felt plenty, respectfully, just the same. And as we turned the corner of one of the buildings here, she grasped my hand. Hers was trembling. Love and let love is my motto, dearie, said this seraph of my dreams. Come, we're losing a lot of time getting started. That girl thought I was dead slow. She didn't know that just then I imagined the great love of my life was just entering the door. It was cruel the way she got down from the pedestal I had built for her. Suppose I should ask you to name the influence that is having most to do with shaping the thoughts of young America. What would you answer? Undoubtedly, the moving pictures. It is from the movies that your children learn what life is. If I can show you that a certain thing is in the movies, you can surely not deny that it is passing every day and night into the hearts and minds of millions of our boys and girls. Take a vote among the girls. What would they consider the most delightful destiny in life? Surely nine out of ten would answer to become a screen star and pose before a world of admirers and be paid a million dollars a year. Make a test and see, and put that fact together with the one I have already stated, that in order to get an important job in the movies, a girl must regularly, and as a matter of course, part with her virtue. You will be told, no doubt, that this is a slanderous statement, so let me give you a little evidence. I happened within the past year to be in the private office of a well-known moving picture producer, a man who is married and takes care to tell you that he loves his wife. He was producing a play, the heroine of which was supposed to be a daughter of Puritan New England. To play this part, he had engaged a chaste girl, and as a result was in the midst of a queer trouble, which he poured out to me. His leading man had refused to act with this girl, insisting that no girl could act a part of love unless she had had passionate experience. No such thing had ever been heard of in moving pictures before. Likewise, the director agreed that no girl who is chaste could act for the screen, and the producer asked my advice about it. Mr. William Allen White of Kansas was present in the office and authorizes me to state that he substantiates this anecdote. We both advised the producer to stand by the girl, and he did so, and the picture went out and proved to be what in trade parlance is termed a frost. That is to say, your children didn't care for it, and it cost the producer something like a hundred thousand dollars to make this attempt to defy the conventions of the moving picture world. I will tell you another story. I have a friend, a prominent man in Los Angeles, who was appealed to by a young lady who wished to act in the movies. My friend introduced this young lady to a very prominent screen actor, who in turn introduced her to one of the biggest producers in America, one of the men whose million-dollar feature pictures are regularly exploited. The producer examined the young lady's figure and told her that she would do. He added, quite casually, and as a matter of course, that she would be expected to pay the price. The young lady took exception to this proposition and gave up the chance. She told my friend about it, and he, being a man of the world, accustomed to dealing with the foibles of his fellow men, wrote a note to the actor explaining that inasmuch as this young lady had been socially introduced to him, and by him socially introduced to the manager, she should not have been expected to pay the price. To this the actor answered that my friend was correct, and he would see the manager about it. The manager conceded the point, and the young lady got her chance in the movies, and made good without paying the price. 
This story tells you all you need to know about the difference in sex ethics that society applies to the lady and to the daughter of common people. You know, of course, what is the stock theme of all moving pictures, the virtuous daughter of the people who resists all temptations and is finally rescued from her would-be seducer by the strong and sturdy arm of a male doll. Could one ask a more perfect illustration of capitalist hypocrisy than the fact that the girl who plays this role is required to pay with her virtue for the privilege of playing it? And if you knew anything about young girls, you can watch her playing it on the screen and see from her every gesture that what I am telling you is true. My wife knows young girls, and I took her the other day to see a moving picture she said i have solved the problem when i come home on the street cars it happens that i ride with a lot of young girls from the high school i have been watching them and i couldn't imagine what was the matter with them all simple girlish straightforwardness has gone out of them they are making eyes in the strangest manner and at nobody just practicing apparently they wear yearning facial expressions when they start to walk, they do not walk, but writhe and wiggle. I thought there must be some nervous eye and lip disease got abroad in the school, but now, when I go to a moving picture, I discover what it means. They are imitating the stars on the screen. In these pictures, you know, there are ingenue, young girls engaged in making a happy ending to the story by capturing a rich lover and then there are vamps, engaged in seducing young men or breaking up some happy home. In old-style melodrama, it was possible to tell the ingenue from the vamps. The former would trip lightly and glance coyly out of the corners of their eyes, while the vamp moved with slow, languished, writhing, blinking, heavy-lidded, sinister eyes. But nowadays, the vamps have learned to post as ingenue. And the ingenue are as vicious as the vamps. They both make the same glances and culminate in the same sensual swoon. It is all sex and nothing else, except revolvers and fighting and wild rushing about. And then, too, there are the musical comedies, made wholly out of sex, being known as girl shows, or more frankly still, leg shows a row of half-naked women prancing and gyrating on the stage and in front of them rows of bald-headed old men gazing at them greedily also college boys or boys too imbecile to get through college sending in their cards with boxes of costly flowers you will be shocked as you read my plain statements of fact but if you are the average american you will take your family to a musical show which has come straight from the brothels of Paris, every illusion of which is obscene. I remember once being in a small town in the South when one of these road shows arrived from New York, and I realized that this institution was simply a traveling house of ill fame. The whole male portion of the town was a quiver with excitement, a mixture of lust and fear. I live in Southern California, one of the many places in America where the idle rich gather for their diversion. The country is dotted with palatial hotels, and a golden flood of pleasure seekers come in every winter. I have talked with some of the college boys in this part of the country, and also with teachers who try to save the boys. They report these swell hotels as hotbeds of vice haunted by married women with automobiles and nothing to do, who wish to go into the canyons for sexual riots. Even elderly women, white-haired women, old enough to be your grandmother. I have had them pointed out to me in these hotels, their cheeks and lips covered with rouge, with pink silk tights on their calves, and nothing else, almost up to their knees, and nothing at all halfway down their backs. These old women seek to prey on boys, wanting their youth and being willing to lavish money upon them. They are preying on your boys, you prosperous businessmen 
who have preached the gospel of each for himself and are proud of your skill to prey upon society you heap up your fortunes and call it success and are secure and happy you have made your children safe against want you think but how are you going to make them safe against the vamps who prey upon the overwhelming excitements of youth and betray your sons before your very eyes teaching them lust in their youth so that love may never be born in their stunted hearts all the haunts of gilded vice are thriving and somebody's boy is paying the interest on the capital to say nothing of paying the police many years ago i paid a call upon anthony comstock head of the society for the prevention of vice comstock was an old-style puritan and many insist that he was likewise an old-style grafter however that may be he had a collection of literature of pornography which would cause any man to hesitate in condemning his activities there is a vast traffic in this kind of thing it is sold by pack peddlers all over the country and it is sold in little shops in the neighborhood of public schools you may be sure that in your school there are some boys who know where to get it even though they will not tell what they know i will describe just one piece that a schoolboy brought to me a catalogue of obscene literature for sale in spain and to be ordered wholesale you know how men with wares to sell will expend their imaginations and exhaust their vocabulary in describing to you the charms of each particular article for sale here was a catalog of one or two hundred pages listing thousands of items pictures pamphlets and books and various implements of vice all set forth in that imitation ecstasy of department stores and seed catalogues here was something neat here was a fancy one this one was a peach and that one was a winner when i was a lad i was tramping in the adirondack mountains and was picked up by an itinerant photographer we rode all day together and he became friendly and showed me some obscene pictures presently he discovered that he was dealing with a young moralist and apparently it was the first time he had ever had that experience he talked honestly and we became friends on a different basis this man had a wife and children at home but he traveled all over the mountains and was like the sailor with the girl in every port also he was thoroughly familiar with all forms of unnatural vice and took this also as a matter of course and spread it on his journeys the other day i read a statement by a prominent physician in new york he had been talking with a police captain and had asked him to state what in his opinion was the most significant development in the social life of new york the answer was the spread of male prostitution here is a subject to which i have to admit my courage is unequal i cannot repeat the jokes which i have heard young men tell about these matters and about the attitude of the police to them suffice it to say that these hideous forms of voice are now the commonplace of the underworld of all our great cities the other day a friend of mine was talking with a prostitute who had left a high-class resort where the price charged was ten dollars and gone to live in a fifty-cent house frequented by sailors she was asked the reason and her explanation was the sailors are natural dr william j robinson has written in his magazine an account of the haunts in berlin which are frequented by the victims of unnatural vice they are allowed to meet openly and to solicit frank harris in his life of oscar wilde tells how when that scandal was at its height and further exposure threatened swarms of the most prominent men in england suddenly discovered that it was advisable for them to travel on the continent the great public schools of england are rotten with these practices the younger boys learn them from the older ones and are victims all the rest of their lives and the corruption is creeping through our own social body 
and you think that all you have to do is not to know about it? My friend Floyd Dell, reading this manuscript, insists that this chapter and the one following are too severe. In case others should agree with him, I quote two newspaper items which appear while I am reading the proofs. The first is from an interview with H. Gordon Selfridge, the London merchant, telling his impressions of America. He tells about the flappers, and then about the shifters. The other is the newly exploited shifters. The shifters are an organization of mushroom growth among high school girls and boys, which is spreading through the eastern states and winning converts among youngsters. It is described as the flapper Ku Klux, and its emblem, if worn by a girl, according to high school teachers and children's society leaders who oppose it, to be nothing more or less than an invitation to be kissed. To call it an organization, even, is an exaggeration, for the shifters are better described as a secret understanding without any responsible head. From being a seemingly harmless group whose emblem was originally a brass paper clip, fastened in the coat lapel, it has developed by rapid strides. Manufacturers of emblems are coining money by the sale of hands, palm outstretched. The significance is to take what you want or... As the motto of the order says, be a good fellow, get something for nothing. One of the principles is to do one's parents referred to as they. The second item is an Associated Press dispatch. St. Louis, March 10, in reiterating his statements that a girls' and boys' secret organization requiring that all applicants must have violated the moral code before admission was granted, existed in a local high school, Victor J. Miller, president of the Board of Police Commissioners, tonight named the Solden High School as the one in which the alleged immoral conditions exist. The school is attended largely by children of the wealthy West End citizens. End of chapter 30 Chapter 31 Sex and the Smart Set portrays the moral customs of those who set the fashion in our present-day world. We have discussed what is happening to our young people. Let us next consider what our mature people are doing. Having mentioned conditions in England, I will give a glimpse of London high life two years before the war. As a visiting writer, I was invited to luncheon at the home of a woman novelist, whose books at that time were widely read, both in her country and here. Present at the luncheon was a prominent publisher, who I afterwards learned was the lady's lover, also the lady's grown and married son. The publisher looked like a buxom hunting squire, but the lady told me that he was very unhappy, because his wife would not divorce him. The lady had just come from a weekend party at the home of an earl, who at this moment occupies one of the highest posts in the gift of the British Empire. Things had gone comically wrong at this country house party, she said, because the hostess had failed to remember that Lord So-and-so was at present living with Lady Somebody Else. One of the duties of the hostesses at house parties, it appears, is to know who is living with whom, in order that they may be put in connecting rooms. In this case, his lordship had been grouchy, and everybody's pleasure had been spoiled. This produced a discussion of the subject of marriage, and the son remarked that marriage was like an old slipper. You wore it because you had got used to it, but you did not talk about it because it was unimportant and stupid. I went away and happened to mention these matters to a friend who had met this woman novelist in Nice. The novelist had there, in a group of people, been introduced to a young girl who was suffering from neurasthenia. My dear, said the novelist affectionately, what you need is to have an illegitimate baby. This, you will say, is the old world, and you always knew that it was corrupt. If so, let me tell you a few things that I have seen among the upper circles of our own great and virtuous democracy. My first acquaintance with New York society came after the publication of The Jungle. 
as the author of that book i was a sensation almost as much so as if i had won the heavyweight championship of the world out of curiosity i accepted an invitation for a weekend amid what is called the hunting set of long island here was a gorgeous palace with many tapestries and soft-footed servants and decanters and cocktails at every stage of one's journey about the place like coaling stations on the trade routes of the british empire one of the first sights that caught my young eye was a large and stately lady in semi-undress smoking a big black cigar if i were to mention her name every newspaper reader in america would know her and before i had been introduced to her i heard two young men in evening dress make an obscene remark about her and what she was waiting for that evening i discovered quickly while there was a great deal of sex among these people there was very little love there was principally a wish to score cleverly and subtly at the expense of another person's feelings it is called the smart set you understand and i will give you an idea of how smart it is i was walking down a passage with a lady and on a couch sat another lady side by side with a certain very famous lawyer whose golden eloquence you have probably listened to from platforms and whom for the purpose of this anecdote i will name jones mr jones and the lady on the sofa were sitting very close together and my companion with a bright smile over her shoulder called out be careful mary you'll be scattering a lot of little joneses around here if you don't watch out quite continental you perceive and a long way from the puritanism of our ancestors from there i went to the billiard room and observed a young man of fashion trying to play billiards when he was half drunk it was a funny spectacle and they took away his cigarette by force for fear he would drop it on the cloth of the billiard table pretty soon he was telling about a racing meet and an orgy with a negro woman in a stable therefore i returned to where the ladies were gathered and one middle-aged matron who had read widely including some of my books engaged me in serious conversation i came later on to know her rather well and she told me her views of love the source of all the sex troubles of humanity was that they took the relationship seriously modern discoveries made it unnecessary to attach importance to it she herself acting upon this theory probably had relations with my friends reading the proofs of this book begged me to omit the number of men because you would not believe me you may argue that it is not typical say that i fell into the clutches of some particular group of degenerates all i can tell you is that these people are as socially prominent as any in new york city i will say furthermore that i have sat in the home of the best-known corporation lawyer in america who has paid a million dollars to organize the steel trust the late james b dill at that time a member of the court of appeals of new jersey and have heard him muckrake his business friends by the hour with stories of that sort i have heard him tell of the steel crowd hiring a trolley car and a load of prostitutes and champagne and taking an all-night trip from one city to another smashing up both the car and the prostitutes i have heard him tell of sitting on the deck of a sound steamer and overhearing two of his wall street associates and their wives arranging to trade partners for the night i have mentioned a lady who had a great many lovers once in the dining room of a club on fifth avenue commonly known as the millionaires a companion pointed out various people many of whom i had read about in the newspapers and told me funny stories about them see that old boy with a notebook said my host that is jacob so-and-so and he is entering up the cost of his lunch he keeps accounts of everything even his women he told me that he had had over a thousand and that they had cost him over a million it is impossible to say what is the most terrible thing in capitalist society but among the most terrible are assuredly the old men the richest and most powerful banker in america was in his sex habits the merry jest of new york society 
he took toward women the same attitude as king edward the seventh if he wanted one he went up and asked for her and it made no difference who she was or where she was this man's personal living expenses were five thousand dollars a day and all women understood that they might have anything within reason when i was a boy living in new york there was a certain aged money-lender about whom one read something in the newspapers almost every day he was a prominent figure because he was worth eighty millions yet wore an old rusty black suit and saved every penny every now and then you would read in the paper how some woman had been arrested for attempting to blackmail him in his office it seemed puzzling because you wouldn't think of him as a likely subject for blackmail some years later i met dorothy richardson author of the long day a very fine book which has been undeservedly forgotten miss richardson had been a reporter for the new york herald and had been sent to interview this old money lender she was ushered into his private office and as soon as the attendant had gone out and closed the door the old man came up and without a word of preliminaries grabbed her in his arms like a gorilla she fought and scratched and got out and was wise enough to say nothing about it therefore there was nothing published about another attempt to blackmail the aged moneylender what this means is that men of unlimited means live lives of unbridled lust and then in their old age they are helpless victims of their own impulses there was a certain enormously wealthy united states senator from west virginia who came very near to being vice president of the united states this doddering old man would go about the streets of washington with a couple of very decorous and carefully trained attendants and whenever an attractive young woman would pass on the street or when one would approach the senator these two attendants would quietly slip their arms into his and hold him fast they would do this so that the ordinary person would not suspect what was going on but would think the old man was being supported you do not have to take these things on my word the newspapers are full of them all the time and they are proven in court just now as i write the president of the most powerful bank in america is claiming in court that his children are not his own but that their father is an indian guide his wife on the other hand is accusing the banker of having played the role of husband to several other women he would take these women traveling on his yacht which quaintly enough was termed the modesty also the papers have been full of the hammond case here is a wealthy man republican national committeeman from oklahoma who is about to go to washington to advise our new president whom to appoint to office from that state before he goes he casts off his mistress and she shoots him she was his secretary it appears and helped him to make his fortune she has made many friends and a million dollars is spent to save her life the prosecuting attorney calls her a painted snake and accuses her of having sat week after week displaying to the jury twenty-four inches of silk stockinged shin bone the jury apparently unable to withstand this allurement acquits the woman and she announces that she intends to bring suit under the man's will to get his money also she is going into the movies and tells us that it is to be for educational purposes everything in our capitalist society must be educational you understand it was p t barnum who discovered that the american people would flock to look at a five-legged calf if it was presented as educational the moving pictures and the theaters are the honey pots which gather the feminine beauty and youthful charm of our country for the convenience of rich men's lust these girls swarm in the theatrical agencies and in the artist studios they starve for a while and finally they yield in every great city there are thousands of men of wealth whose only occupation is to prey upon such girls i know a certain theatrical manager the most famous in the united states a sensual stout little jew he is a man of culture and subtle insight and in the course of his conversation he described to me quite casually and as a matter of course 
the charm of deflowering a virgin. Nothing could equal that sensation. The first time was the last. Many years ago there was a horrible scandal in New York. The most famous architect in America was murdered, and the newspapers probed into his life, and it was revealed to us that many of the most famous artists and men about town in New York maintained elaborate studios, equipped with every luxury, all the paraphernalia of all the vices of the ages, and through these places there flowed an endless stream of beautiful young girls. In every large city in America you will find an athletic club, and if you go there and listen to the gossip, you'll discover that there are scores of idle rich men with automobiles and private apartments and a staff of procurers used in praying, not merely upon young girls, but also upon young boys. And these are not merely the children of the poor, they are the children of all but the rich and powerful. In the movies, you see pictures of girls lured into automobiles and carried out into the country, or seduced by means of knockout drops, and you think this is just melodrama. But it is happening all the time. In every big city of our country, the police know that hundreds of young girls disappear every year. At a recent convention of police chiefs in Washington, it was stated from police records that 60,000 girls disappear every year in the United States, leaving no trace. Unless the parents happen to be in position to make a fuss, not even the names of the girls are published in the newspapers. I do not ask you to believe such things on my word. Believe District Attorney Sims of Chicago, who made the most thorough study of this subject ever made in America, and wrote, When a white slave is sold and landed in a house or dive, she becomes a prisoner. In each of these places is a room having but one door, to which the keeper holds the keys. Here are locked all the street clothes, shoes, and ordinary apparel. The finery provided for the girls is of a nature to make their appearance on the street impossible. Then, in addition to this handicap, the girl is placed at once in debt to the keeper for a wardrobe. She cannot escape while she is in debt, and she can never get out of debt. Not many of the women in this class expect to live more than ten years. Perhaps the average is less. Many die painful deaths by disease, many by consumption but it is hardly beyond the truth to say that suicide is their general expectation. End of chapter 31